Today, my wife and I are visiting at Colonial Williamsburg, an amazing living history museum in Virginia that tells the early part of America's enduring story. Come along with me and my wife as we explore a history buff's paradise. That's coming up next. How are you guys doing today? Hello. I wasn't terrible. One second. So guys, welcome to the 4 o'clock live series here. So this is the second live series program of this week. We run our live series program Sunday through Wednesday. Uh, every day that you come here to 4 o'clock, you'll see a different member of the American Indian staff here talking about uh, a different subject. Uh, today we're going to be highlighting education and education's tool or use as a tool in assimilation. Uh, but before we go any further, please allow me to introduce myself. So Naham Pipi, who we saw. Martin with Kilikewa, Martin and Shepherd with Tokahi. I said, hello, uh, good afternoon, my relatives. My name is Martin I'm from the Shepherd and Martin families, and I'm Saponi from the High Plains community in Person County, North Carolina. Um, education, though, when we look across the world, education is something that all societies have, right? How many teachers do I have here? Or school administrators? Yeah. Today we have professional educators. Today our system of education, at least in this country, is very stratified. You have grade levels, you have achievements that you have to make, you have to pass those grade levels to advance. And so you have forms of education that are incredibly structured in the way that they work. Other societies have more of an informal uh, education system, whether that's education that is done by relatives or direct family or kind of the broader the community that those kids live in, uh, that's how that is structured. The big thing is regardless of how our education system is structured, or who that education is administered by, everybody in society believes that the way that they educate children, the way that their children gain knowledge, whether it's formal or informal, is the best. It creates the most useful adults in society, the most productive adults in society. We can kind of see uh, Benjamin and Franklin echo that here. While he's here in Williamsburg, he writes some papers, the notes on the savages of North America. Those papers start out with uh, the phrase that says, savages, we regard them for their ways differ from ours, which we think the pinnacle of civility, and they the same of theirs. But if we were to view all societies with an unbiased eye, we would find no society so polite without remnants of rudeness, nor so rude without rules of politeness. So again, echoing that idea. We all think the way that we do things, the way our society works, the way we teach children, is the best, is the pinnacle. Education here, we're going to be looking at it in the backdrop of the Brafferton Indian School. Now, after you're done here and after we talk and after we ask, ask, uh, answer some questions, you guys can actually go check out the Brafferton Indian School. It's still standing. It's down there on the campus of William and Mary. It is the second oldest building on campus, and today it's the office of the president. Just like any of our schools today, the Brafferton requires funding. The Brafferton is constructed in 1723, but Indian education at William & Mary starts prior to its construction. All of the Indian education, really until almost the end of their program of educating Indian boys in 1784, is paid for by the estate, the will of a man named Robert Boyle. Robert Boyle is a famous English scientist. He dies about two years before William & Mary is actually founded. In his will, though, he sets aside funds for Christian and charitable acts. And so when William and Mary is founded, part of its initial charter and part of its charter today is William and Mary has an obligation to educate Indian children. In this period, it's specifically boys, but in general, Indian children. Robert Boyle's will, the arbiters of his will, uh, keepers of his will, were purchased the Brafferton Manor, big old building in England, lots of rooms, and then parcels those rooms out, rents them out. Proceeds from those rentals come here for the construction and education of that school. Well, like I said, they're, in, they're educating Indian boys long before the Brafferton is constructed. The problem with the Brafferton, the problem with Indian education in Williamsburg in general, is there's a lot of holes in it. There's a lot of records that are incomplete. 
For example, the first eight students to be educated at William and Mary that are Indian children are sold to the school by an Indian trader, eight of them. We don't have their names, we don't have their communities, we don't have where they're from, we don't even have what happens to them or where they go when their schooling commences, or completes, excuse me. We have no idea who these eight boys are, but they are the first eight boys sold to the school. 1723, the building's finished and constructed. Now you've got boys from all over the place, and they're there to gain an English education. Three to five years is typically what they're spending at the Brafferton. They're reading and writing, so they're becoming literate in English. They're learning the sciences. They're learning arithmetic, philosophy. They're learning astronomy. And then they're attending church in the center of town at the Bruton Height Parish Church. So the idea of this school is that it's a charity school. So education always has an aim, right? We want to prepare adults. The aim here is that by extending this courtesy, by showing Indian children just how great English civilization is, English education is, English religion is, uh, that they will be so impressed by that that they will go home and they will convert their fellows. How many of y'all think that happens? Ooh. Yeah, good guess. Doesn't happen ever. Yeah, spoilers does not ever occur. Not that we can ever document. No, those boys are going back home and attempting to get uh, the rest of their community to look like English folks. Now, the Brafferton is unique. Here in Virginia, there are laws about how certain types of Indian folks interact with each other. In Brafferton, those laws don't really apply. In Brafferton, we see two big, broad groups of Indian children being brought together, together and educated at the same time. And that's the local tribes, who are tributary, who are subjects of the crown. They become subjects in 1677 and again in 1680 where they give up all of their land holdings in exchange for protection from Virginia colonists by the king. They get land grants to live on. Uh, think of them as like modern day reservations. So a uh, three mile set of land with a two mile buffer zone that is for their exclusive use for their towns, the farm fields, uh, agriculture, uh, whatever else they need to do there. Uh, and excluding any use by any non-Indian person. In that treaty, it initially stipulates there's an annual tribute of 20 beaver skins that must be paid yearly to the governor. It's been about 20 years of that treaty, the beaver population here in Virginia collapses. And so the collateral, the tribute that those tribes must uh, give up or are obligated to send every year becomes two boys to attend that Brafferton Indians. Those young men have no choice. Those tribes have no choice but to send two young men there and keep them there at all times. So if one graduates, he comes home, another one is sent to take his place. The other group of folks we're seeing in this period are called foreign Indians, and these are folks which England and Britain still consider to be sovereign. So Cherokees, uh, Creeks, Catawbas, Lenapes, Wyandots, all these folks who are outside of the jurisdiction of England, of Britain, and who Britain is treating with as a sovereign nation, so discussing uh, economics and military alliances and borders and boundaries and land claims. Those folks are offered spots at the Brafferton as a kind of a political maneuver. If you send your boys here, they'll learn English, they'll learn to read, they'll learn to write, they'll learn about English culture. So if you send them here, they'll better be able to negotiate. You won't have to speak through our translators. You'll now have people in your own community who can make these agreements for you or with you. For the most part though, those two groups of people it is illegal for them to interact with each other. So when those delegations are here in the city and those tributary tribes are doing business, they cannot interact with each other against the law. And in fact, it is uh, an arrestable offense for tributary Indians to be involved or engaged at any point with foreign Indians. There's several accounts of folks being locked up in jail and stuff like that for exactly that. Now, this school goes on for quite some time. Opens up in 1723. The last kind of uh, year of class is going to be 1784. So it's open for almost 60 years. There's about 20 students in attendance at any given time throughout the years. You're talking to several hundred, excuse me, several hundred students by the time this closes. Most of those children we can't document. We don't necessarily know their names or their communities, or we have a little bit of information, so we have some names. We don't know what communities they come from. We don't know where they go or where they came from. Other times we get really good details. And we're gonna highlight a couple of those folks. But those 
foreign tribes that are coming here are coming great distances. One of the last boys to attend, and we'll highlight him in a minute, Henry Bobby comes all the way from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, almost Canada, to come here for school. Now imagine there's no cars, there's no trains, there's no airplanes. That boy is coming by foot to come to school here. But some of the ones that we can document really well, Thomas Stepp is a very early attendee of the Brafferton Indian School. He is not away, so he's from one of the local tributary tribes that's obligated to send boys to the Brafferton. The Brafferton and the Nottaway have kind of an interesting relationship for a couple reasons. One, Nottaway headmen, the leadership of that community, do not want to send their boys to the point that they're locked up in the stocks until they capitulate and decide to send boys to school. They are most definitely forced to send children to that school. They do not want their young men to attend. The other thing that's interesting with Nottaway is they create a last name, or a last name gets created for boys who attend the school. The last name Scholar begins to pop up several years after those boys start attending school, and it seems to be exclusively attached to boys who go, graduate, and return home from that school. And there are people who have the last name Scholar that descend from those folks in the Nottaway community today. But Thomas Stepp attends here as a young boy, serves his time, about three, four years. After he goes, he goes back home, and eventually the French and Indian War breaks out. This is where we kind of see him uh, spark up again, or peak up again in the history. He fights under Washington. He becomes known as Captain Tom Stepp pretty quickly. He leads Nottaway and Saponi, Catawba, and Cherokee folks against French allied tribes. Washington will write a letter and refer to him as Brother Tom, sending Brother Tom down to speak to Catawba to uh, influence them on the justice of our cause. So influence the Catawba to fight alongside the British as opposed to align themselves to the French. At the war's conclusion, he comes back to Williamsburg, goes to the capital, and he's given a suit of clothes and silver jewelry, given lots and lots of different things and recompense for his service. After the war is over, he goes back to his home community, and he's elected to become one of the headmen. So he's elected to become a speaker for the nation to come here and do political business at the capital to handle those political dealings with other tributary tribes and things like that. Another young man who's from a local group whose story is equally as interesting is Robert Marsh, or Mush, depending on which spelling you look at. But he's Pamunkey. He and several other Pamunkey boys are at school. They're in attendance at the Brafferton when the Revolutionary War breaks out, and they immediately enlist. They enlist out of school, immediately join the Continental Line. So fighting in the Virginia line, shoulder to shoulder, to shoulder with the rest of the folks who enlist. He's captured in Charleston like much of the Virginia line is in that disastrous battle. He's held as prisoner for several months, and eventually he's sent home. There's a prisoner exchange. He gets to come home to Virginia. When he comes home to Virginia, he re-enlists, fights in the siege at Yorktown, the last major battle of the uh, revolution, and then continues to fight until the war's conclusion. At the end, him and his wife and his family, they go down to South Carolina and becomes a preacher. At some point, he comes back or he passes away in South Carolina. The records aren't especially clear there. But after his passing, his wife begins to petition Virginia for his pension. That promise of, hey, you've served in this continental line, you've fought in this war, we promise that you're going to get effectively a retirement. And so she, there are letters back and forth between her and officials in Virginia where she's providing all this different documentation to prove that she's married to this man. She eventually gets his pension. Robert Marsh is one of the few people who we can see when they come to the Brafferton and then really see what happens to their family even after he's gone. Some of those other boys who are not from these local tribes who are coming here as kind of political envoys or as uh, political maneuvering is John Nettles. John Nettles is a Catawba man. He comes here, learns to read and write, goes home. And he becomes the translator for the nation. Now, Catawba, just like a lot of our languages here on the East Coast, does not have a written component. But what the Catawba do is they request any documents they sign, they request a written copy of it. Any speeches that are given to them, they request a written copy. John Nettle's job is to read those written documents and then translate that orally into the Catawba language. How many folks here speak two languages? Yeah, a couple folks. Uh, do all the kind of concepts and cultural ideas in English translate over to your other language? Not exactly. Yeah, not exactly, right? So now his job is to be that official person. His job is to read those things, understanding English as he does because of his Brafferton schooling, 
and to make and try to explain those concepts to the elected officials in his government, to the fellows in his community, to make or help them make the best decisions possible. Much like Robert Marsh, John Nettles will fight in the Revolutionary War. The Catawba fight alongside the Americans through most of the war and form the Catawba Company, an entire really group of men made up of only Catawba warriors. This is where we kind of lose track of John Nettles. We're not sure if he comes back, if he's killed, he just kind of disappears from the historic record at that point. The last young man we're gonna highlight is a young man named Henry Ball B. I find him personally the most interesting. So Henry Ball B is, is notable for a couple reasons. His stay is not paid for by the will of Robert Boyle. His pay, excuse me, his stay is paid for by Patrick Henry, the first elected governor of Virginia. Patrick Henry brings him here as an idea that, hey, we'll educate this young man, and then he'll go back home, and he'll have nice and kind words to say about Virginia. Does that sound like that plan's gonna happen? Yeah, you guys are sharp, definitely not. So he comes here, his father sends him here specifically to learn what Virginians do, to mimic their behavior so that he can better understand them. Subsequently, Henry Bobby is expelled for school because he drinks and gambles in the tavern, and that's what Virginians do. He goes all the way home. Father says, hey, I sent you to graduate that school. I sent you to learn what Virginians do. Sends him all the way back where he's re-enrolled in school. His stays continue to be paid for by Patrick Henry until he graduates. Now, like I said, that plan of Patrick Henry and Henry Ball B going out and having nice and kind things to say about Virginians and this new American government doesn't really work out. Henry Ball B does not have kind words for uh, the Virginians that he has encountered. Uh, at one point going so far to be arrested as a British spy. We can tell Henry Bobby is an incredibly charismatic young man. For not only is he able to convince his jailer to release him from his captivity, he convinces his jailer to run away with him. Once they leave, we kind of lose track of Henry Ball B uh, in the historic record, or at least the official historic record. It's very clear Henry Ball B was one of these uh, striking characters. You had an opinion one way or another about him. He was not necessarily an overly liked man by people who had allied themselves closely with Virginia and this new American government. Chief White Eyes, a Lenape man, has a lot of unkind things to say about Henry Ball B, calling him one of the greatest scoundrels. Several years after Henry Ball B's release, White Eyes comes back and says, I have killed the great scoundrel. And from that point on, we don't hear a peep from Henry Ball B. Now all of these boys, these four boys, their stay at the Brafferton shapes them. It changes them. It makes them different from the other young men in their community who stayed home. During this time period, there isn't a term or a phrase for it, but today in Indian country, we refer to it as walking in two worlds. This idea of balancing your own language, culture, religious practice, social taboos and customs versus that of the United States, or in this point, England, and its social customs, taboos, language, religion, uh, social constructs and beliefs. It's very clear that not all of these boys adapt to that well. John Nettles, who we talked about, it's written that when he returns home, he marries and has a chill or he marries uh, and has children. It's also specifically noted that he cannot support his family fully by hunting, fishing, or trapping because these activities are completely foreign to him. It is noted that he is uncomfortable amongst his peers and socially awkward, but he is far more comfortable in the company of the English. The education that these young boys receive at home is more of that informal style of education that we spoke about in the beginning. A lot of our societies have large extended kinship networks called clans. And because of the way our societies are structured, matrilineal matriarchal societies, children belong to their mother's family. Which means that young boy's father has really very little to do with his upbringing or his raising. That young boy is gonna have all the social obligations, all the uh, things in the community that uh, his family is obligated to attend to, he's gotta learn them from other men from his mother's family. So his uncles, are gonna be more or less their primary educator, teaching them to hunt deer, set traps, fish, uh, and eventually go to war. 
one of the bigger striking differences is probably going to be uh, recreational time, right? Some of you may have seen folks playing colonial games out there, and they're not necessarily the most uh, physically enduring or, or physically impactful. Within our societies here on the East Coast, we have our, our ball games. So how many of y'all have heard or played lacrosse? Yeah. Yeah, okay, just a few. That's fine. Where does lacrosse come from? Anybody? So lacrosse itself, the French word means crook stick. The rules of that game are based on how Iroquois folks play that game. So up north you'll see ball games played with a single long stick. Down here in the southeast where I'm from, we play with two shorter sticks. No pads, no mouth guard, no nothing. Typically barefoot. And so how our ball game is set up, we've got a pole at one end of the field that one team is trying to touch that ball against, the other team is defending, and a pole at the other end that that defending team is trying to score on and the offensive team is trying to defend. If you want to see exactly how that game is played, you can YouTube it today. It's a lot of fun. But it's played in much the same manner. People are out there in basketball shorts, barefoot, no mouth guards, no pads. You're doing wrestling takedowns, rugby and football tackles, hitting each other with the sticks, doing absolutely whatever you can to prevent that person from scoring. These games can be incredibly huge. Some of the largest games on record are 500 versus 500, and they last for days. That is not the type of physical assertion uh, or physical exercise that these young men here at the Brafferton are going to get. And oftentimes, when it's offered, tribes are declining to send their children here. The Virginia delegates go up to New York and they're treating with the Iroquois. And they offer the Iroquois, if you'll send a half dozen or more of your boys down, we'll pay for their stay, their food, their lodging, their care, and then we'll give them an English education. The Iroquois in their fashion take a full day to kind of weigh this uh, option out, to give it the thorough thought that it needs. The next day they return and they thank the, the Virginians. They say, we do kindly thank you for your offer. We do know the expense of housing these children, uh, but we are familiar with these institutions in your northern territories. And when our young men return, they cannot run, fish, fight. They cannot stalk a deer or kill a man. They speak the language imperfect and are therefore good for nothing. They cannot be warriors, hunters, or orators. But if you, as Virginians, would send half a dozen more of your boys to live with us, we will make them true men. Going back to that thing at the beginning, that we all think that we, the way we educate children is going to make them the most effective and successful in our societies. <coughs> now, the big question that people ask about the Brafferton is, was it worth it? Do we ask that about our schools today? What do you think, teachers, administrators? How many tests, how many assessments, how much justification do you have to do for your budget? Is it a lot or a little? Yeah, it's a lot. And so the same thing gets asked about the Brafferton. Was the money spent here educating Indian children impactful? Was it worth it? And that kind of depends on who you're asking. For these native communities, you have examples like John Nettles, who becomes a translator. You have community members who can now go into these political negotiations and speak on the behalf of their community as opposed to speaking through a translator. So for a lot of those communities, it is going to be a valuable tool of politics to send their young men here to gain an education. For some of the uh, colonists, uh, they may have a little bit of a different story. We have some writings from one of the former headmasters of the Brafferton, and he pretty much laments that once these boys return home, it's as if they had never attended school at all, and they return to their barbarity and savagery. It's pretty much they come to school, they do what they have to do for their three to five years, and they go home and cut up like any other kid or young adult would in society, pretty much leaving all this education behind. The Brafferton sets the stage, though. It closes in 1784, but it sets the stage for the U.S. and Canadian government. This idea of using education as a tool to attempt or to push assimilation policies. Within the last two months here, uh, really in Canada, it's been more noteworthy, um, but it should be kind of heading this way in the United States. So in Canada, in the last two months, they have found uh, 5,286 bodies of children buried at residential schools. Some of those in unmarked mass graves, the largest of which was 751 children. 
Children as young as three were found in those graves. These were schools that were run by the U.S. and Canadian government. The Canadian government ran 191 of those schools. The U.S. government ran 365. The last of those schools closed down in 1996. The vast majority of us here are older than that last school. These schools, it was the idea of the Brafferton, but turned up to 12. You're going to bring these children in, you're going to give them Christian names, force them to take English names, or French if you're in Quebec, but European names to say the least. You're going to punish them heavily for speaking their language, practicing their religion, you'll cut their hair, they'll take their personal effects and belongings, the nicest of which are now in museums, the poor quality were burned in front of the children, and you'll keep those children from about three or five years old all the way up until they're almost 18. The idea of these schools in the legislation here in the United States was to kill the Indian and save the man. I say that it's coming here in the United States because Deb Holland, who is uh, the highest ranking native person ever to be selected for a cabinet position, is now in charge of the Department of the Interior, and she's setting up an inquest which is going to go look into those schools. Carlisle Indian School, which is not too far away from us in Pennsylvania, we know that there are 300 or 180 children buried at marked graves at that school. And that's one of 365 schools that this country ran into the early 90s. I imagine that we're going to have some similar numbers to what we're finding in Canada as it goes on and we begin to explore these kind of large school grounds. Now, I will take some questions, but I do want to point out that as you guys leave up on that music stand up there, there are more resources about boarding residential schools. I break them up into categories of uh, stuff for adults, stuff for children. There are also two movies up there. There's Iron Horse, and then there is We Were, we Were Children. One is on Netflix, one is on Amazon Prime, so if you have those streaming services, they're free to watch. But I would encourage you to kind of look into where you guys are from, and if there are Indian schools there, ask them. Ask them about it. We have one not too far away. 30 minutes from here is Hampton Institution. It's known as Hampton University today. It's an HBCU, historically black college. But it's founded as Hampton Institute, where the idea of educating Indian children and African children at the same time. It's actually the very first Indian boarding school here on the East Coast, predates Carlisle. It goes from like 1880s all the way until 1923. They have a nice little museum there has all sorts of gifts that those Indian kids gave the university. I think gave is a very generous term, but it's their museum and not mine. Now, I have talked for a long, long time. I know it is hot. Do you guys have any questions for me? So she wants to know, with, like, with the tributary tribes who are obligated to send two boys, do we have any idea of how that process is being done or how those boys are being selected? Unfortunately, no. Once the tribes become a tributary of Virginia, really a lot of the record keeping stops because now they're just other English subjects who happen to live on separate land grants. And so uh, it's not commonplace for anyone aside from the trustees of those land grants to go visit, and they're not necessarily interested in doing record keeping. So kind of like Scotland and Ireland and Wales, they're allowed to make their decisions on their own home territory, but they're still subject to all British laws and regulations. So it's pretty much the same thing there. They're having, each of those communities will have their own kind of internal process of how young boys are selected to go and stay and be educated. And that's probably gonna be at least a little different between the tributary tribes. Are you talking about like the boarding schools? So Carlisle five years ago released the first like four sets of remains back to Crow Nation. Um, Carlisle closed in 1913. So those children had been there buried for over a hundred years before they were returned to their home communities. Um, just like two or three weeks ago, Lakota folks came and took like five or six children who were buried at Carlisle and reburied them back home. Um, the problem is uh, in Canada, where you've got mass graves of, of unmarked bodies, you can't tell where those kids are. You don't know who they are. Uh, if you're burying someone in a big pit with a bunch of other bodies, you're purposely obfuscating who those folks are, who they were, and what communities they came from. So I think returning the remains of, of those children is gonna be substantially harder. 
so she's asking who's going to be involved in that. So really the only reason any of those sites were uncovered um, is really because of folks my age in Native communities who grew up hearing stories of mass graves and mass burials from their parents or grandparents who attended those schools. Um, the Canadian government had uh, what it called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was about five years ago, and they tallied um, marked graves of about like 3,500 or something along the, that lines, marked graves at these different schools. Now what's happening is Native folks are going back to these schools and saying, we know that there are more people here. Like my grandfather, my grandfather remembers burying people in a pit. Like we're going to find those people and bring them home. And that's what's beginning to shed light on like in Saskatchewan. In Saskatchewan, between like three schools, they've found over a thousand graves or a thousand bodies and three graves, I guess I should say. Any other questions, guys? One more question. Yeah. I just learned about the residential school situation a few months ago and it's very heartbreaking. I don't like to feel like I'm a victim that I can't do anything or make the world a better place. What would you recommend, what can an individual do with regards to this situation? Because obviously the kids are already dead, the schools are shut down. Is it just education of the plight and caring more about people in general? So, so the question was, you know, what can we do? Like th these things have already happened. We're not bringing those kids back. Those schools are shut down. I think the big thing is, um, a lot of the people who said that those things were completely legal, the politicians who voted to continue those policies, the judges that have held their constitutionality are still in office. And it's raising awareness of those issues. For a long time, Native issues haven't been the thing that get people elected or not elected. And so it's very easy for politicians on both sides of the aisle to absolutely ignore things that affect us as Native people. And so I encourage anybody, if you have a voice, you can use that to amplify native folks in their concerns, whether it's around this, whether it's around um, environmental racism, whatever that issue is, we have platforms where we can allow our voice to amplify those of people who are in the minorities in this country. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, anything else, guys? Well, I know it's hot. You probably want to go find some AC. Thank you so much for joining me. Like I said, there's a board over there. You can take photos of those books I recommend. Uh, if you're here with us tomorrow, come check us out from uh, 10 to 12 at the Carriage House over at the Palace Green and 1.30 to 3.30 at the uh, American Indian Encampment right across the street from the Carpenter's Yard at Nichols and Botetot, and then here again at 4 o'clock. Uh, if you're not with us and you still want more content, check our YouTube page out, our Facebook page, uh, the Colonial Williamsburg website. We have uh, videos, we have blog posts, all sorts of extra information there. Uh, and if not, have a good day, go find some AC, get something cold to drink, enjoy your evening. Thank you guys. Well, that's a wrap for this Colonial Williamsburg video. I hope you really enjoyed it, getting to see another part of this amazing Living History Museum. If you like this sort of stuff, check out my other videos, check out colonialwilliamsburg.org to plan your own visit here because it's so much cooler in real life than it is on film. Until next time, this is History Buff, TN Photobug signing out, and I'm having a blast with the past.